So, 15 past. Welcome to this, the second lecture in the course about compilers. And today's subject will be um, languages and grammars, because you remember a compiler is a program that translates a program in one language to another program that does the same things, but in another language. So we need to look at what we mean when we say language. And <clears throat> language is, you know, that we have grammars to describe uh, languages. Uh, we also talk about syntax, which is the way you can build sentences in a language. If it's a computer language or uh, a normal human language. Uh, you also remember the phases of the compiler. You have phase one, which is the scanner, which takes the program text and splits it into tokens, such as keywords, identifiers, operators, and so on. And then comes phase two, which takes this stream of tokens that we get from the scanner uh, <coughs> and compares it to the grammar. This we call the syntax analyzer or the parser. Let's also say something about computer languages. Um, we uh, talk about computer languages and human or natural languages such as Swedish and English. Uh, computer languages are usually much simpler than human languages. And uh, you know that human languages, it's, it's hard to uh, write an exact grammar for a language such as, such as English. You can say things in many different ways, you can move words around in various ways. And typically you can't do that as much in a computer language. It has to be much simpler. Uh, the grammar describes <coughs> the language, as we said, and if we uh, look at Swedish uh, or English, maybe we could have a rule, a rule that says a sentence consists of a noun followed by, by a verb and then a point to end the sentence. For example, uh, suns, the suns, all the suns in the galaxy suddenly explode. Yeah. <coughs> A slightly um, more advanced grammar for uh, a much simpler language. Let's look at that. Let's say that we have a language. A language which allows you to greet people. You can say, hello. You can also say, good morning. You can say, good evening. And you can say, good afternoon. And this is our language, because we define a language as the set of things you're allowed to say in that language. The set of sentences or uh, complete inputs or strings, you sometimes say, uh, that are allowed in the language. So one of these you can say in this language. So let's try to Make a grammar. A grammar for this language. Now, we must decide what to call things. These are the things you can say in the language. Um, you notice you have one, two, three, four, five different words that you can use. But what do we call the things we say? Uh, let's say we call it a greeting. And a greeting can be 
Hello. A greeting can also be good morning. A greeting can be good evening. And good afternoon. Uh, this is probably the simplest way to write a grammar for this language. And <coughs> since it turned out to be quite a lot to write. Uh, we can write. Uh, we can write the same grammar in a slightly more compact format. So I write here the same grammar. You can say that the greeting is either hello or good morning or good evening. Or, no, oh, not. It should be this um, uh, pipe characters from um, Unix and C. So, uh, this thing that we call a greeting, that is what describes the allowed input or the allowed things you're allowed to say in the language. Uh, and since <coughs> greetings, I mean, greeting is not something you see in the actual language. It is just an, uh, a name of, we use when we describe the syntax. So this we call a non-terminal. As compared to the things you actually see in the language, these are called terminals. And the point with that is that uh, <coughs> the non-terminals, you expand them to something else. For example, the terminal hello. So they are non-terminals, they need to be expanded. But if you have a terminal, you can't expand it. A thing like this, <coughs> where you say that a greeting can be the string good morning. We call this a production. So a production is about the same thing as a rule, but more, um, more exact. Because this thing here, is that one rule or four rules? Well, it is four productions, because you can, you can produce four different things. Okay. <clears throat> That was two ways of writing the same grammar. We can have another grammar for the same language. Another grammar. We can say that a greeting is either hello or it is good followed by Let's call it time, a time specification. And the time specification, then, we can write another rule here that describes what a time can be. It can be morning. It can be evening. Or it can be afternoon. So. Now we have two non-terminals the greeting and the time, which can be expanded to, well, as you can see here, according to the productions. So you see that the same language can be described using several different grammars. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, And now I can't write in italics on um, the uh, board here, but typically you write non-terminals using italics. That is, um, like that. And 
sometimes you use the ter use bold face for the um, the terminals. You also need to say what is the start symbol, because if I just look at this grammar. <coughs> I don't really know how to form a complete greeting, a complete sentence. Can I use just time and say morning? Well, in real English I can do that, but in, in this language I can't because I have to use one of these four different sentences. Uh, <coughs> but we decide that greeting here is the start symbol. Okay. If we instead start with the grammar, how do we know what language that grammar describes? What language? Well, <coughs> yes, please. Say again. Start symbol, because uh, when I uh, match some input against the grammar, I need to know what, what describes a complete input. So, for example, if I just say morning, okay, I look at the grammar and say, oh, if I have, a, well, it's a time, so it matches. But it's not enough to, much, to match just time. You need to match a complete greeting. So that's why greeting is the start symbol. Okay? So, what language does this grammar describe? Well, we know already, but let's see how we can find out. Well, <coughs> you start, unsurprisingly, with a start symbol. Because what you want to have is a greeting. And we look at our two productions for a greeting. It can be either hello or good time. And which of these are terminals and which are non-terminals? Well, if I underline the terminals, we see that here we only have terminals. We only have one terminal, so we can't expand it anymore. So here we are, so to speak, finished. So one of the sentences that we're allowed to use in our language is hello. Time, on the other hand, I should do it this way instead. Uh, <coughs> it is good that it's the terminal. Don't like hello there. But I can expand time. <coughs> and I have three different productions for time. Good morning, two terminals, good evening, and good afternoon. So, and now I have no more non-terminals that I can expand, so I have to finish here. And the four sentences that are allowed in this language are these four. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. So by starting with a sort symbol and expanding everything as much as I can, I can find out what language our grammar describes. This was a very small language. Let's take a larger language, an infinitely large language. An infinite language, <coughs> which consists of sums only using the number three. So you can say three, 
you can say 3 plus 3, you can say 3 plus 3 plus 3, you can say 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, and so on. And we see that we have in this language only two terminals, the number 3 and the plus operator. So, <clears throat> how should we describe this language? Well, let's call it the start symbol a sum, or a sum of threes or something. And we can observe that the number three is, well, let's call it a sum, so we generalize the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> concept of a sum from several things that you add together to just one. So a sum can be three, and then you can have a sum, any sum, and add plus three at the end, making a slightly bigger sum. Well, correction. So, the sum is either one single three, or you have another sum and add a three at the end. So, if you, for example, take three plus three plus three, okay, <coughs> this is a sum using the first production. Uh, and then you can use the second production to say that this sum plus 3 is another sum. And then you can take that sum and add plus 3, creating this third sum. Okay? And we can do the same expansion as we did before, starting with the start symbol, which is sum. It has to be some because it's the only non-terminal we have. Uh, it can be either 3 or sum plus 3. And we don't get any further there. But here we can expand sum to either 3 or sum plus 3. But we expanded this part, so we need to keep this part, the plus 3. And we can't get any further here, we only have terminals. But here we can expand the non-terminal sum to, according to the two productions, either 3 or sum plus 3. And then we have the rest here, because we only expanded sum to these two, and then we have plus three, plus three, plus three, plus three. And here we don't get any further, but down here we can, again, expand. And it at least looks like this is the same language that we started with. Hmm? Um, can you describe the, the grammar of the language itself, in itself? Can you describe the grammar of a language? <coughs> well, not this language. It is way too simple, but um, I mean, you can write a book that describes the Swedish language and write that book in Swedish. You think in Gödel's theorem or something like that. Hmm. Describing the writing down symbols on the board, I would prefer you using some sort of symbols that instantiate pair of symbols or a group of symbols because the sum is, can't see, since you're not writing in cursive, it's. Okay, let's. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to see the difference between the terminals and non terminals. So we could, for example, 
write nice little boxes around the non around the terminals like this. Okay. Uh, now we can now we've <coughs> created a language and a grammar that describes that language for sums, but only for sums of the, num uh, the number three. So let's see if we can have a grammar for larger sums. I mean, not larger sums, but uh, not restricted just to the number three. So instead of this language, ah, I'll erase it. More general sums. For example, 4 plus 3, 8 plus 9 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2, 7, and so on. So, <coughs> basically the same language, except that it's not just the number 3, it's any single digit number. And you can probably guess how we can write this language, uh, this grammar. Uh, we need to have more than just three. And the uh, brute force way of doing this is to say that the sum is either the number zero, or the number one, or the number two, or the number three, or the number four, or the number five, or six, or seven, or eight, or nine, or as before, we start with the sum and add something at the end, so we can have sum plus zero, or sum plus one, or sum plus two, or sum plus three, or sum plus four. You don't have to write all this down, but no, I, <coughs> I am doing it just so no one, if I, um, so no one thinks that you can skip things and it automatically works anyway. Uh, <coughs> as before, a single digit can be a sum, for example, seven, and then you can take that sum and add something at the end, for example, plus seven. So here we have another sum. And you can keep adding plus single digit numbers at the end. Uh, it works, but maybe we can create another grammar. Where we define a digit as zero or one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. Okay, maybe we can fix that problem too, but not yet. Uh, and then a sum is either a single, a single digit or a sum plus a single digit. And now we have basically the same grammar as we had for the threes except we now have digits, the non-terminal digit, instead of just the number three. Or, we move some work to the scanner. Yet, Because you remember that the scanner recognizes tokens in the input. And here we have assumed that the scanner gives us <coughs> one of these 11 tokens. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the plus sign. If we instead let the scanner give us the terminal digit, Here we have the scanner. You give the input 4 in the source language to the scanner, and the scanner says it's a digit, and then sends that to the parser. 
Well, then our grammar becomes much easier. Then you say a sum is either a single digit or a sum plus a digit. You don't need this first line here. That is enough for our parser to work with. Uh, it will be able to recognize that these are valid inputs, valid sentences in this language. Uh, but not, for example, if I write 1 plus 3 plus plus 4, because then I have a digit, a plus, a digit, a plus, another plus, and a 4, so this is not allowed. Of course, for the rest of the compiler to uh, be able to produce some sort of useful output, we need to tell that rest of the compiler which digit. So I can, in the scanner, associate what we call a lexical value. Lexical value with the token. So I get the token digit from the scanner, but I say that, okay, it's a digit, but which digit? Well, it's the digit number four. But that does not matter for the parser. The parser ignores all lexical values. It just cares about which tokens do I get. And in this case, it's a token digit. Okay? So you can see, we can sometimes move work between the scanner and the parser and let the scanner do more or sometimes less. I think I've said before, yes, um, last time that the parser can be uh, written, created using either a normal programming language you write as a, a module uh, in C or Java or some other language, or you can use a parser generator, a tool such as Bison, which basically lets you input the grammar as input to this parser generator, and then it builds a parser from the grammar, which is of course much easier to actually write the program that does it. Uh, <clears throat> another thing we need to talk about are parse trees. Yeah. If we keep this second grammar and ignore the first one, I will draw a Pores tree. So what is the pores tree? Well, obviously it is the tree that the parser builds when it parses the input. It is sometimes called a concrete syntax tree. It is a tree that describes the syntax of the input and will get to the concrete part later. There are concrete and abstract syntax trees, uh, but we'll wait with that. If we start from down here and write the actual input to our um, compiler, it says three plus four plus five. Then uh, the scanner tokenizes the input, makes token out, out of it, make, makes tokens out of it. So we have a token stream, which <coughs> remember, uh, <coughs> you remember we said that what 
the scanner returns is um, the token digit or the terminal digit, a plus sign or a, rather the plus token, uh, another digit plus and digit. So this is the token stream from the scan. And you remember that we said that we can um, if I draw that here, three, three plus four, that's fine. You remember that we said that we could say that this single digit here is a sum, and then we have sum plus digit, which creates another sum, and that sum plus a digit becomes a sum. When you have uh, boxes inside boxes like this, you can draw it as a tree. You can say that, okay, this digit here, the three, is a sum. And then you have a sum plus a digit, which becomes another sum. And then you have that sum plus the digit five, which becomes yet another sum. So here we have drawn actually the same thing, but once as a tree and once as uh, things inside things. Same. And this is the parse tree. It describes how the input is grouped into the syntax elements of the grammar. Okay? Um, I said that the, uh, the parser builds this tree and generates it. It's not certain that it actually does this, but it, it uh, <coughs> uh, works through the input and the productions in the grammar in a way that it could build this tree. It might generate some other type of output. As you probably can guess, it's a bit... Some of these things are unnecessary. If um, <coughs> I take this digit and add it to that digit, is it really necessary to say that, okay, I call this digit a sum? This node in the tree, it's not really useful, except as to show how we have parsed the input. And we can also simplify a bit if we remove this sum. If we, instead of saying that uh, this digit plus this digit is a sum, we can just say, we take this digit and this digit, and then uh, we move this plus up to the node here, the parent node. And if we do the same thing here, we move this plus up here, then we get another type of tree that looks like let me remove this grammar here. Then I get a tree that looks like this. Uh, you see, it, it, we can see that it has sort of the same information here. We take the digit um, three, the digit four, and the digit five, and add them together. First the digit three and the digit four, and then the result of that, we add it to, uh, or we add five to it. We have simplified this parse tree by uh, moving operators up to the parent node and removing uh, nodes that only have a single subtree. 
And this is what we call a syntax tree. Or sometimes an abstract syntax tree. Parse tree, syntax tree. Uh, and as usual, terms are sometimes used in, in different ways, but this is the way we are going to use it in this course and that the book uses. Uh, the reason it's called a, a concrete syntax tree and a, an abstract syntax tree is, <coughs> well, what does abstraction mean? Uh, when you abstract, use a more abstract term for something, uh, you have removed details. If I say that, okay, this um, group of people here, this course consists of you and you and you and you, and I describe everyone, then I've been very concrete. I've described everyone individually. Or if I just say, well, you're the, you're the students who take the course, then I've abstracted away all the details, which I've done here. Okay. Any comments so far? Let us look at still the same language. We add together single digit numbers, but now we'll have a worse grammar. Grammar, bad. And how will the bad grammar look? Well, <clears throat> could we not just say that a sum is either a single digit as before, or, well, if you have a sum and a sum, you can add them together. Sum plus sum. Okay. So if you take the same input here, three plus, oh, let's move, do it here, three plus four plus five, you say it's a digit, it's a plus sign, it's a digit. It's a plus sign and it's a digit. And then you use that grammar. Now we don't add a sum and a digit, but we add a sum and another sum. So I need to start by saying that this digit is a sum, this digit is a sum, this digit is a sum. And then I can take <coughs> the second production and add together these two sums to a new sum. And these two sums, a new sum. So it's almost the same thing as before. Almost the same thing, except I call this one a sum, and I call this one a sum, which I didn't before. I call this one a sum, and then I call these two a sum, and these two are some. Okay, it works. And it describes the same language. It is not that I have um, a different language. You can write three plus 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 or something like that. Uh, it still describes the same language, so it works in that way. But why would this be a bad grammar? Or at least worse than the first one. Well, you don't need to, but... Not optimized. Yeah. You can't go about digits. Say again? You can't go about digits. You can't. It's more abstract. More abstract. Well, all of this is true. I mean, I'm adding needless nodes. Yeah, um, that's true. But we have another problem. Loops. And 
The problem is that uh, <coughs> if I make space here for the same input, 3 plus 4 plus 5, notice, same. Uh, we get, of course, the same token stream because the scanner who creates the uh, token stream knows nothing about the parser or uh, grammars. It just creates tokens. Digit plus digit plus digit. And then uh, <coughs> I need to start by calling each digit a sum. And maybe you can see the problem now. Let's take 4 plus 5 and call that a sum. Allowed? Yes, a sum plus a sum. And then I have this sum plus that sum. And now, instead of 3 plus 4 plus 5, if you're going to calculate it. I get 3 plus the sum of 4 and 5, like this. Uh, <coughs> since we're using plus, we will get the same result. But if we had, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, minus, we would get different values. And if we have some rules about data types, you could still get, the diff uh, get different results. So, you see, the problem with this grammar is that it <coughs> you can create different parse trees for the same input. You can create two or more parse trees for the same input, and this is what we call an ambiguous I think I spelled it correctly. In Swedish, tvetydig. You don't really know the input. Uh, how to interpret the input. 3 plus 4 plus 5. Well, is it this or is it that that is correct? And natural languages like Swedish have this all the time. You remember the sentence with, um, uh, I see the man with the telescope. So, do I see the man through the telescope? Or do I see the man and the man has the telescope? I see the man. So, do I see the man with the telescope, or do I see the man and this part with the telescope connects to C? Same. Yes? Would the implementation of that, uh, that double count the four, if it were to, I know it's uh, ambiguous, but uh, would two fours be the final sum uh, if you were just try to implement it uh, as such, such as that? I'm not sure I follow. It sends both uh, up layers to sums which it uh, count uh, lower layer of sum as part of its sum. So we're going to do like double count and then the result would be twice uh, We don't do any additional plus operations. So I'm not sure how we could yeah. count it twice. I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand the question. Maybe we'll take a break, and you you can uh, show me. <laughs> okay. So, 15 minutes break. So let's continue. We had um, some simple 
languages for sums. Now we are going to use a um, slightly bigger language with uh, multiplication also. And now um, we need to take into consideration that we have two priority levels. You know, the, um, when we have an expression such as this, 8 times 2 plus 2 times 3, how do you calculate that? Well, you remember that multiplication has higher precedence or priority uh, than plus, so you start with this one, 16, and this one, 6, and then you can add them together, so you get 22. What happens when you have the same the same priorities? For example, plus has the same priority as plus, of course. So, how do you group this one together? From the left, yeah, it's what we call left associative. So, you start by building groups from the left, like this. So, you have uh, operator priority and associativity how they associate with each other. So how do we create a grammar for this language? Well, you, can, you remember that when you have a multiplication, you multiply two factors, and when you add things together, you add two terms. So maybe we can try this grammar. You have an expression, uh, e, for expression, which consists of a term plus a term. And then I need to say what a term is. Well, a term is a factor times a factor. And a factor, what is that? Well, it's a single digit like this. So if you have um, 3 times 4 plus 5 times 6, Each of these are, according to the scanner, digits. So this one is a digit, this one is a digit, digit, digit. And then you can group them together using, uh, or actually you just call each digit a factor. And then you have factor times factor makes a term, you have a factor times factor here, makes a term, and then you have term plus term, which, according to our grammar, uh, creates an expression. Uh, it worked for that particular input, but maybe uh, there are some problems with this grammar. Do you see some problems? Yeah, if you want to multiply, multiply like more than two things. Yeah. This only works for the special case of a digit times a digit plus a digit times a digit. So uh, <coughs> this one works, but not this one, not this one, not this one. You need to have this specific format with four numbers. And maybe we see some other problem. Yeah, you remember ambiguity. We won't get that far because we cannot have any more than um, this particular uh, configuration of, of um, input. But um, term plus term seems a bit uh, suspicious. Uh, Let's try something else. Maybe <coughs> number two. You have an expression that can be um, uh, an expression plus an expression. 
or it can be an expression times an expression, or it can be a single digit. Now I call everything an expression. What do we have any problems here? Ambiguity. Ambiguity, yes. Uh, now we don't have, uh, now we have more flexibility in the input. We don't need digit times digit plus digit times digit. We can have, let's say, three plus four times five. We call this an expression. We call this an expression. We call this an expression. But now we don't know if we should start with um, uh, this expression plus an expression, and then have expression times expression. This would be the wrong way to do it. But it works with the grammar. And also the other way, starting with multiplication and then addition, also works with the grammar. So it's an ambiguous, uh, ambiguous grammar, and it's ambiguous in two different ways. Uh, one way is that we completely ignore operator priority. Plus and times, well, we can start with anyone. And we also, when we have the same priority, we have the same problem as we have seen before. Uh, should I start with this, or should I start with this? So we need to do something else. Yeah. Maybe if you remember what we did before, we had expressions and then added things at the end. So if I try to say that a factor, maybe three, our third attempt to write a grammar, uh, as before, I say that a factor is a single digit. And a term, well, what can a term be? A term can be just a factor, because if I want to add together two numbers like this, or let's say three numbers, well, <clears throat> I can create a term by multiplying two uh, numbers like this and then add them, but clearly I should be able to just add a single number. I don't need to multiply it with something first to be able to add it. So a single factor can be a term, right? And then if I have this I should be able to add numbers at the end. Uh, if we take exactly this expression and then I add times 6. Well, I had a term which was 4 times 5 and then I add times 6 at the end. It's still a term. So I can build a term by adding more factors or rather multiplying with more factors. So a a term can be either a single factor or I have a term and multiply it with a factor like this. Then I can <coughs> chain more and more multiplications uh, at the end of my term. Okay? Uh, to create an actual expression, I need to maybe add together a number of terms uh, or use a single term. If I have a seven, well, it's a factor according to this. And it's also a term according to this production here that the factor can be interpreted as a term. That's the same thing as saying that a term can be expanded to a factor. Uh, if uh, I call this a term, well, then it's a complete expression. So let's say that an expression 
can be a single term, like this, or, well, let's do the same thing as we did before. I have a term, oh, I have an expression, three, that's my expression, and then I chain new terms at the end and get a new expression, and I can che keep changing terms at the end of my expression. So, an expression is either a single term or I have an expression and add a term at the end. Then I get left associativity. I chain things at the end. So I start by grouping from the left and add things at the end. Now, this. This works. Uh, we uh, have handled associativity, as I said, by putting uh, or chaining things at the end. And I've also added or handled uh, operator priority by starting with multiplication. So by multiplying things, I get a term, and then by adding uh, terms together to each other, um, I get an expression. So now it is at least supposed to work. And I will not have any ambiguity here. Uh, I will only be able to build a single parse tree. We can try to uh, see what language this grammar describes by starting with the start symbol. And the start symbol will be expression. And what can expression be? It can be either a term or an expression plus a term. The term can be either a single factor or a term plus a uh, times a factor. Uh, <coughs> the factor will be a digit. So our grammar allows we allows us to have a single digit. Uh, <coughs> here we have four different expansions. Term, as we see, it can be a factor or term times factor. And since we have two expansions of factor, uh, we get uh, the same two uh, expansions of term again, and then we have factor, which can be either fa factor, no, uh, factor is, no, correction, um, uh, term times factor, no, no, no. Let me correct this. Factor can only be expanded in one way. Am I correct now? I mean, this part here expands either to factor or term times factor, and then I just put times factor at the end because I, I still have to use that. And here, <coughs> what can this be? Well, it has to be digit times digit, and now I only have um, terminals. But here, uh, term can still be expanded either to factor or term times factor. And I have um, this part that I need to copy, times factor, times factor, times factor, times factor. And here we get 
digit times digit times digit. So it seems that at least we can multiply any number of digits because we see here that when we get to um, uh, <coughs> this one, of course, continues. But we get digit, digit times digit, digit times digit times digit. So we, up here we get any number of digits. Which seems reasonable because the expression, if the expression is a single term, then we won't have any plus operations in it. We will just have multiplication. But down here, uh, <coughs> our expression can be either term uh, or expression plus term. And then we have plus t and plus t. And then you need to expand both this t and this t according to the same rule as before. So here we get the four different ones. Uh, a term, it can be factor plus factor. It can be uh, term times factor. See, am I okay now? Plus factor. I'm getting confused now, it's so much. Uh, <laughs> factor terms times factor plus uh, term times factor, right? I think I am doing it correctly here. Uh, do you see any errors? Well, <coughs> at least we will here get digit plus digit. And if we keep doing this, we may be able to see some patterns here that uh, it seems like it's the correct language we're describing. But since just with these few rules, we get quite a lot of uh, possible expansions here. Uh, it gets suddenly much harder to see what we're doing than when we had a very simple grammars. Okay? Let's look at... Um, what we are going to do on the labs. I'll erase this. The labs um, are sort of built around uh, a simple compiler that comes with uh, actually the older version of the book. Uh, it reads input uh, in the form of normal infix expressions. You know what infix notation is, that you put the operator in between the operands. Uh, <coughs> it translates this to postfix notation, so 2, 3, plus. And if you have postfix, you also have prefix notation, plus two, three. Uh, we're not using that, we're just using infix and postfix in the labs. Um, this may seem strange, but if you compare to function notation, when we uh, call a function with arguments, that's basically the same thing. And here we are used to using uh, prefix notation. Uh, you can build a tree. 
a syntax tree. And all these describe the same expression and the same syntax tree. It's just the way that you uh, order the nodes and the, uh, uh, the leaf nodes and the uh, inner nodes. So 2 plus 3 gets infix, 2, 3 plus with the, node, uh, the parent node at the end gets postfix. And if you start with the parent node, you have prefix. Okay. And if we take something slightly more complicated, again, infix, 2 plus 3 times 4. Uh, we have seen the tree. If I put the tree at the end, well, how, looks, how, how does the, th uh, the tree look? Well, remember, this is the highest priority, so you multiply 3 and 4, and then you add together plus and the result of 3 times 4. So how do we write this as postfix? Let's ignore the prefix and stuff. Well, Four, two, three. I should start with two. Two, three, four. Plus two, yeah. Remember, I should first this part, then that part, and then that part. So start with the left part, then the right part, and then finally the plus, right? And what is the left part? It's two. What is the right part? Well, then we recursively do the same thing. Left subtree, right subtree, parent node. Three, four times. Okay? And if you had uh, two times three plus four, uh, and look at the tree for that, then it's two, two, times 3 <coughs> plus 4, like this. Then you, uh, again, start with the left subtree, then the right subtree, and then the plus. And we can start by going down recursively and write 2, 3, multiplication. So this gets translated to 2, 3, multiplication, 4, plus. Okay? And the nice part with this is that, uh, first of all, you don't need any parentheses. If I want to do 2 times 3 plus 4 and start with plus, so I have this tree down here. Uh, 2 times plus 3, 4. Well, I need to add parentheses when I'm using infix. But with postfix, I do the same as I did before. Left subtree, right subtree, then the parent node. So, 2, and then we can take the entire right subtree, 3, 4, plus, 3, 4, plus, and multiply together. So you don't need to use parentheses. And the second nice thing with postfix notation is it's very easy to write a calculator that calculates the value. Uh, <coughs> If we start by looking at the tree, well, how do you calculate the value? Well, uh, you need to start somewhere at the bottom here. So this, of course, has the value 3. 
this has the value 4, and then you take 3 plus 4, so out of this part you get 7. And then here you have 2, and then you multiply 2 and 7 and get 14 out of it. Uh, so values sort of flow from the bottom of the tree upwards. Uh, <clears throat> this you can do if you actually build the tree uh, using pointers in, in memory. Yes? I have a question. If you move the 2 to, to the right side, uh, it should be the same as 4. Say again? If you move the 3 to the number 2, you switch the Here. You mean... Um, if I understand you correctly... Yes. yes. Well, this is a different expression. This is the expression using infix 3, 4, uh, 3 plus 4 times 2. So it will, get the, it will give the same result, because multiplication is commutative. a times b is the same as b times a. But it's not the same expression. And the postfix for this one is 3, 4, plus 2 times. Left, right, parent node. Left, right, parent node. Okay. The nice part uh, is that postfix is very e postfix is very easy to write uh, an evaluator for that calculates your postfix expressions. Uh, you need a stack, and you don't need you can don't need to use I mean the call stack uh, that your computer uses when it calls functions. Uh, that's not what I mean. I mean a normal stack where you put numbers. So to calculate postfix, let's take this one. You have the stack and then you have two simple rules. If you get a number, then you put it on the stack. If you get an operator, you take two numbers from the stack, perform the operation and put back the result. If, if number push on stack to if operator pop from stack, pop from stack, calculate and push back the result. So with two, three times four plus, here's our stack. So first comes the number 2, you put it on the stack. Then comes the number 3, put it on the stack. Then comes the operator multiplication. Pop, pop, calculate, push. So you pop the 3, you pop the 2, and put back the result, 6. Next thing that happens is that it com there comes a number, number 4. So you put it on the stack. And then an operator. Uh, <clears throat> pop, pop, calculate, push. So you pop the 4, you pop the 6, you add them together, because it says plus, it's 10, and you put it on the stack. And at the end, you will, unless it was a malformed uh, postfix expression, you will get a single value on the stack, which is the result. Okay? So when you later uh, calculate the values in our simple uh, compiler that uh, translates from infix to postfix, it will be very easy to do so. Uh, I would say that although that uh, using uh, um, postfix, uh, yeah. the first when the operator says it's akin to a function. Prefix. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is somewhat more easier. Because we can use the, the call stack as a... Well, yeah, if, if, you, if you have the call stack, if your 
doing this is as a program in C or C sharp or something, uh, where you can call functions, then it's. Uh, the, but you don't need this. You don't need recursion here. You just need to. You can do this in assembler for on a few uh, instructions. Functions which can take your variable, and you sort of limited. Yeah. That's the thing about the. Yeah. But it's um, at least it's easier than in fix, where you need to take care of associativity and priority. Okay, let's see syntax definitions. Yeah. So far, we have had expressions, but we are, of course, since we're working with compilers, we are interested in uh, uh, computer languages. Yeah. If the if statement in C. What is the grammar for that one? Uh, for example, you can write if a equals b, uh, print f. Parentheses. Parentheses? You mean uh, the curly brace? Oh, no. Nope. Uh, actually, you don't need it. You don't need it. Uh, <clears throat> What the, what the grammar says is you have a statement. It can be a compound statement, a block with braces, but it doesn't have to be. So this is okay. So the grammar for C has the production that says that uh, an if statement uh, consists of, first you have the keyword if, then you need a parenthesis, uh, then you have some expression. And this is of course not a terminal, not a token, this is something that is defined elsewhere in the grammar. So. Uh, for example, it works to say if zero. Because zero is an expression. Uh, <clears throat> and then you have a statement. It can be, and it very often is, uh, what's called a compound statement or a block with these uh, curly braces and more, uh, a number of statements inside. Or it can be a single statement, as we saw there. Uh, and then you have an optional else part. With the keyword else and a statement. And this is not really a grammar, this is a, a pattern, I should say. And the simplest statement is what is called the null statement, which is just a single semicolon. So this is probably the simplest possible if statement you can create. Which says if zero, which is interpreted as false. If false, do nothing. So nothing will happen. Uh, so this is, let's say, pattern. But to uh, make an actual grammar of this, uh, a statement can be lots of different things. Uh, <clears throat> but it can be an if statement with a parenthesis, an expression, an end parenthesis, uh, and then the statement. So now I have uh, written the terminals, the tokens, as boxes, 
and the, the words, the terms that don't have boxes are non-terminals. These need to be expanded. That is the uh, if statement without the else. And I can also have The same if statement, but with an else point. And it could, of course, have been possible to, instead of this, saying that here comes an, uh, something that is optional. I could call it optional else. And then the optional else could be either a um, else statement or nothing at all. And then uh, we have lots of more statements. For example, this uh, uh, block statement, uh, which contains a statement list. And then the end, that's not the number three, this is the curly brace. So. And many more statements. Statement can also be lots of other things. So, now we have started with uh, a grammar for C. Was yes? Can you write a grammar for uh, variable decoration or point of the direction? It's uh, always complicated. Yes, right? yes. Um, there are complicated things in C, yes. But still, for far from as complicated as a natural language is. Try to write a grammar for Swedish or English or any other natural language. Uh, we call this a context-free... No. We call this a context-free grammar because uh, anywhere in our program if we have a place where we can put a statement, we can put all these statements there. It doesn't matter what's around. In a place where there can be a statement, for example, here, this means I can put another if statement here. I can put uh, a block statement in there or any of the other statements, possible statements. So I don't need to care what's around uh, the context. So, what does the context-free grammar consist of? Well, as we said, it's a set of uh, terminals. Also called tokens or token types. You also have a set of non-terminals. Such as statement, which, and remember this, this is not part of the actual language. Uh, <coughs> your C program will not suddenly say statement. Uh, it's just part of the grammar. Well, you can say statement, but then it's a name <coughs> variable. Uh, these non-terminals uh, are just ways of describing the syntax of the language. You have also a set of productions. And then, finally, you need to say, what is the start symbol? Which of the non-terminals is the start symbol? String is not a text string. What I mean is a sentence or input to the compiler. Uh, a sequence of tokens. Or 
Well, actually, it's not a sequence of tokens. It will become a sequence of tokens when the scanner has, uh, um, has uh, tokenized it. Typically, it's a sequence of characters that then will be tokenized. But this is the input to uh, the compiler. And a string, it's called a string because it's a string of tokens. Uh, usually it's called a sentence, but more in a natural language uh, context when you talk about Swedish and English. Uh, I sometimes say input, because it is the input to the compiler. And remember that we said, what is a language? It is the set of valid strings or inputs. So you can have an infinite language, such as our uh, sums and uh, expressions, those languages, or you can have a finite language, such as our uh, greeting language with good morning and good afternoon. And finally, uh, the empty symbol. The, um, uh, you remember that <coughs> I said we could have written this as a, in a different way, with something that's called optional else. I could have said that an if statement is if uh, followed by this, followed by that, followed by this, uh, followed by statement, which is uh, start the uh, which is the part that's run when the expression is true, and then I have something I can call optional else part. And the optional else part is either it says the keyword else and you get the statement, or it is nothing. And to um, specify that I mean nothing, I have this empty symbol. Okay, questions? Empty symbol. Empty symbol. It, yeah. Well, it, it's um, in mathematics. It's uh, isn't it a um, belong, to. belong to a set, oh, exactly. member of a set. Yeah. Well. Sometimes you can write it like this also. Uh, an E, but uh, here we use this one. Or you can just write empty. empty. It works too. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.